In the 1960s, two people met. This meeting would bring together two souls whose relationship would mean the torture deaths of innocent children and decades of misery for the victims' families. The evil pair went on to be the most hated persons in Britain. Ian Brady, a slender 27-year-old stock clerk with sharp, cruel features and a quiff hairstyle, and his girlfriend, Myra Hindley, a 23-year-old typist with dyed blonde hair, met in Manchester in 1961. The shy girl quickly became infatuated with Brady, who appeared very confident. He was a self-styled Nazi who had gathered a substantial collection of Nazi literature and an obsession with sadistic sex. He soon convinced Hindley to pose in obscene positions and would afterwards sell these images. Apparently, one of their earliest ambitions was to make their fortune in the illicit amateur pornography market, selling photographs of themselves in various sexual poses. But, for whatever reason, this enterprise failed. The relationship between Brady and Hindley evolved with Brady's increasingly obsessive identification with Nazi-era atrocities and his growing sadomasochistic sexual appetite. Hindley was Brady's eager student. Under his influence, she stopped going to church and started hating children. Then they turned their attention to a new enterprise, planning a series of bank robberies, which they never had the courage to carry out. Inevitably, Brady became fascinated with the idea of rape and murder for sexual gratification. Hindley actively participated in procuring child victims, as well as sexually abusing, torturing and murdering them. Ian Brady was born January 2, 1938 in Glasgow and grew up in the rough slum neighbourhood of the Gorbals. His mother, Peggy Stewart, a waitress who served in a tea room, found it difficult bringing up a child on her own and so she gave him up for adoption. Ian's father has never been identified. Peggy Stewart claimed that he was a journalist who died a few months before their son was born. Early on, Ian showed troubling signs of dysfunctional behavior and moodiness. When he could not have his way, he would throw violent tantrums, which sometimes ended with him banging his head against the wall. His sullen arrogance, unsociable personality, and lack of football skills made him unpopular with the local children. Myra Hindley was born on the 23rd of July 1942 in Crumpsall, a suburb in Manchester. When Hindley was four years old, her parents had another daughter, Maureen. At this time, Hindley was sent temporarily to live with her grandmother to give her parents some more space with the new baby. However, afterwards the move became permanent. Hindley's grandmother lived in the house behind the family home 
and so visits were frequent. Initially, Hindley struggled in primary school and failed her 11-plus exams. Afterwards, she attended Ryder Brow Secondary Modern School, where she was known to be one of the most intelligent in the class, with an above-average IQ. Her grades might have been good, but her record of attendance was poor. Her grandmother enjoyed her company and didn't try to stop her from playing truant from school. Brady was also a bright student, and at the age of 11, he passed the entrance exams to Shorelands Academy. His potential was never realized, however, as he had no self-discipline, was lazy, and misbehaved constantly. He started smoking and soon lost interest in his school education altogether. His fascination with Nazi Germany began early. He often asked other boys for souvenirs that their fathers brought back from the war and when playing war games on the estate with other kids, he would insist on being the German. It was at this time that Ian also became known for perverse and sadistic tendencies, including bullying smaller children and torturing animals. By the time he was a teenager, he was a confirmed delinquent and had been brought before the juvenile courts on charges of burglary and housebreaking. On the first two occasions, he was given probation, but on the third he was deemed incorrigible, and the court ordered him to leave Glasgow and live with his mother. In November 1954, two months before his 17th birthday, Brady travelled down to Manchester to live with his mother and her new husband. Although he did not get along with Mr Brady, Ian took his stepfather's name and used it for his own. When Hindley was aged eight, a local boy approached her in the street and scratched both of her cheeks with his fingernails, drawing blood. She burst into tears and ran into her parents' house to be met by her father, who demanded that she go and punch him, cause if you don't, I'll leather you. Hindley found the boy and succeeded in knocking him down with a sequence of punches, defeating her antagonist. As she wrote later, at eight years old, I'd scored my first victory. As Hindley developed into a young woman, she became tough and aggressive. Some even considered her to be masculine. She had a low and husky voice, and she was mocked for the shape of her nose. She was even given the cruel nickname, Square Ass, by fellow students because of her broad hips. Later though, as a teenager, Hindley took a number of children and younger teenagers under her wing and was a responsible babysitter. She befriended a 13-year-old boy named Michael Higgins when she was 15 years old and was emotionally distraught when he drowned in a local reservoir. Hindley felt tremendous guilt over his death because she was not there when he drowned.
Hindley's first job was a junior clerk at a local electrical engineering firm. She ran errands, made tea and typed. She was well liked at the firm, enough so that when she lost her first week's wage packet, the other girls had a collection to replace it. She began bleaching her hair and became engaged at age 17 to a certain Ronnie Sinclair. The engagement was called off several months later. Hindley apparently thought Sinclair immature and would be unable to provide her with the life she had envisaged for herself. She took judo lessons once a week at a local school, but found partners reluctant to train with her, as she was often slow to release her grip. When Hindley was 18 years old, she started working as a secretary at Millwood's Merchandising, which was a manufacturer of various oil and soap products, located on Levenshume Road, Manchester. Brady felt like an outsider in Manchester. These compounded feelings of isolation and hostility began to manifest in other ways. He would often spend hours in his room reading and listening to music. He developed an interest in the writings of the Marquis de Sade and Friedrich Nietzsche, focusing particular attention on Nietzsche's theories of Übermensch and the will to power. He became increasingly interested in literature that championed cruelty and torture and the idea that superior creatures had the right to control and destroy, if necessary, weaker ones. Around this time he worked as a butcher's assistant, and some have surmised that the experience may have nurtured his growing interest in the physical acts of mutilation and murder. He also began drinking heavily and resorted once again to theft. After being convicted of these petty crimes, he was sentenced to two years training at a Borstal school, as well as a short incarceration at Strangeways Prison. After being released, he worked for a short time as a labourer for Boddington's Brewery in 1958, before spending a few more months unemployed. Brady eventually found a job in February 1959 as a stock clerk at Millwood's Merchandising. When Hindley started her first day at Millwood's, she couldn't take her eyes off the reserved young man with the quiff. She would later say that when she first met Brady, she was enamoured with his dark hair, deep blue eyes and fresh complexion, and that he was the first man she ever met that kept his fingernails manicured and clean. He was well dressed and rode a motorbike. Everything about him fascinated her. She would gaze fondly at him as he spent his lunch break in the office canteen reading Mein Kampf. Hindley became smitten with the slightly older man, and over the next few months she made entries in her diary about him, but grew increasingly disillusioned with him because he showed no interest in her. That is, until the 22nd of December at a Christmas office party, when Brady asked her on a date to the cinema, where they watched a film about the Nuremberg Trials. Like an immature schoolgirl, she wrote in her diary, I hope Ian and I love each other all our lives and get married and are happy ever after. 
Wanting to impress Brady, she started dressing more Germanic by wearing short skirts, waistcoats and high-heeled boots. She gobbled up his anti-society philosophy and became as much a social misfit as he was. She even kept a photograph of Irma Gresa, a female SS guard at Auschwitz und Ravensbrück concentration camps, in her handbag, and Brady started to call her Hesse in some bizarre homage to Rudolf Hess. Hindley claimed that Brady began to talk about committing the perfect murder in July of 1963, and often read out chapters from May 11's Compulsion, published in 1956. The novel, a fictionalized account of the Leopold and Loeb case, tells the story of two young men from well-to-do families who attempt to carry out the perfect murder of a 12-year-old boy, and who escape the death penalty because of their age. Brady and Hindley's first victim was 16-year-old Pauline Reed, a neighbour of Hindley's, who disappeared on her way to a dance in Crumsall on the 12th of July 1963. That evening, Brady told Hindley to drive her van around the local area while he followed behind on his motorcycle. When he spotted a likely victim, he would flash his headlight and Hindley was to stop and offer that person a lift. Shortly after 8pm, Continuing down Froxma Street, Brady spotted a girl wearing a pale blue coat and white high-heeled shoes walking away from them and signaled for Hindley to stop the van. The girl recognized Hindley. She was a friend of her younger sister, Maureen. Pauline got readily into the van with Hindley, who then asked if she would mind helping to search for an expensive glove she had lost on Saddleworth Moor. The girl didn't have any other plans and agreed. When the van reached the moor, Hindley parked and Brady pulled up shortly afterwards on his motorcycle. She introduced him to Pauline as her boyfriend and said that he had also come to help find the missing glove. Brady apparently led Pauline onto the moor while Hindley waited in the van. After about 30 minutes, Brady returned alone and took Hindley to the spot where the girl lay dying, her throat cut. He told her to stay put while he fetched a spade to bury the body. This he had hidden nearby on a previous visit to the moor. Hindley later described that Pauline's coat was undone and her clothes were in disarray. She had guessed from the time he had taken that Brady had sexually assaulted her. Returning home from the moor in the van, they had loaded the motorcycle into the back. Brady and Hindley passed the girl's mother, Joan, accompanied by her son, Paul, searching the streets for Pauline. Some months later, on the evening of the 23rd of November, 1963, the pair approached 12-year-old John Kilbride, who was by a carpet stall munching crisps. Hindley was in disguise 
and wearing a black wig over her blonde peroxide hair. They said his mum and dad would be worried about him and they could take him back in their car. They also said they had a bottle of sherry and he could try some. He readily got into the Ford Anglia car. It may as well have been his coffin as his short life was just about over. When they reached the moor, Brady took the child with him while Hindley waited in the car. Brady sexually assaulted Kilbride and attempted to slit his throat with a six-inch serrated blade before fatally strangling him with a piece of string, possibly a shoelace. He then buried him in a shallow grave. His body was found there on the 21st of October 1965. The body had still the remnants of clothing. His jeans and underpants were pulled down to mid-thigh and the underpants appeared to be knotted at the back. Hindley hired another car a week after Kilbride went missing, and again on the 21st of December 1963, apparently to make sure the burial sites had not been disturbed. In February 1964, she bought a second-hand Austin Traveller, but soon after traded it for a minivan. On the 16th of June 1964, 12-year-old Keith Bennett disappeared. His stepfather, Jimmy Johnson, became a suspect, in the two years following Bennett's disappearance, Johnson was taken for questioning on four occasions. Just four days after his birthday, Hindley lured the young lad into her car at a market in Ashton under Lyne and asked him to help her carry some boxes. Brady was sitting in the back of the Ford Anglia car that Hindley had hired and grabbed him as he clambered in to load the boxes. After driving to Saddleworth Moor, and using the lost glove lie, Brady disappeared into the gloom with the boy and lured him into a ravine, reappearing 30 minutes later having raped and strangled him. Hindley stood above the ravine and watched the murder. Hindley's sister Maureen married David Smith on the 15th of August 1964. The marriage was promptly performed at a registry office, as Maureen was seven months pregnant. Hindley did not approve of the marriage, but the next day Brady suggested that the four take a day trip to Lake Windermere. This was the first time Brady and Smith had time to get to know each other, and Brady was apparently impressed by Smith's demeanour. The two talked about society, the distribution of wealth and the possibility of robbing a bank. The young Smith was impressed by Brady, who throughout the day had paid for his food and wine. The trip to the Lake District was the first of many outings. Hindley was apparently jealous of their relationship, but became closer to her sister.
desperate for another victim, Brady and Hindley trawled a fairground on Boxing Day 1964 and came across Leslie Ann Downey. Her killing was the most notorious because of the details about her death that were presented in court. Photos of Leslie, along with various books on torture methods, were found in a suitcase belonging to the couple. According to prosecutors, Brady took nine obscene photographs of her, which were later found in a suitcase in a left luggage locker. The photograph showed a young girl in the nude in various pornographic poses, the prosecutor said. She had been gagged with a scarf but was still wearing her shoes and socks. Hindley recorded the child's rape and torture by Brady on an audio tape lasting 13 minutes. Jurors heard the voices of a man and a woman and also of a girl, believed to be Leslie, crying out for her mother and asking God to help her before she was killed. Her body was found in a shallow grave on Saddleworth Moor in October 1965. October 6, 1965, the couple claimed their fifth and final victim, 17-year-old Edward Evans. They enticed him from Manchester Central Railway Station to their house in Hattersley, where Hindley's 18-year-old brother-in-law, David Smith, was visiting. At this point, Brady and Hindley had become intent on corrupting Myra's brother-in-law and recruiting him into their twisted circle, where Brady would talk constantly about murder. Brady decided a practical demonstration would be best to get David Smith involved. Brady crept up on Edward in the kitchen and smashed his head in with an axe, striking him 14 times with a hatchet before finishing the job by strangling him. He ordered Smith to help him carry the corpse to an upstairs bedroom and tie it up ready for disposal, but afterwards Smith ran home. Waking up the next day, the horror of what he had witnessed sunk in and Smith phoned the police and directed them to Brady's address. Smith explained later that, while apparently giving assistance with the cleaning up, his sole concern was to escape the house alive. After searching Brady's home, police discovered a trussed-up body and informed Brady that he was being arrested on suspicion of murder. Brady admitted under police questioning that he and Evans had fought but insisted that he and Smith had murdered Evans between them. Hindley, he said, had only done what she had been told. David Smith told police that Brady and Hindley had hidden evidence in two suitcases stored in a left luggage office somewhere in Manchester at a British transport station. Police were asked to search all of Manchester's train stations and on the 15th of October found what they were looking for. Police later found the left luggage ticket in the back of Hindley's prayer book. On the 16th of October, police found an arm bone sticking out of the peat. Officers presumed they had found the body of John Kilbride but soon discovered that the body was that of Leslie Ann Downey. Anne Downey, Leslie's mother, was shown clothing recovered from the grave and identified it as belonging to her missing daughter.
Brady and Hindley appeared at Hyde Magistrates Court, charged with Leslie Ann Downey's murder. Each were brought before the court separately and remanded into custody for a week. They made a two-minute appearance on the 28th of October and were again remanded into custody. A large collection of photographs was discovered in the evil couple's house, many of which seemed to have been taken on Saddleworth Moor. 150 officers were drafted to search the moor, looking for locations that matched the photographs. Many of the photographs featured Hindley's dog, Puppet, sometimes as a puppy. Detectives arranged for the animal to be examined by a veterinary surgeon to determine its age, from which they could date when the photos were taken. The examination involved an analysis of the dog's teeth, which required a general anaesthetic, during which the dog passed away, as it suffered from an undiagnosed kidney complaint. On hearing the news of her dog's death, Hindley became furious and accused the police of murdering Puppet, one of the few occasions detectives witnessed any emotional response from her. In a letter to her mother shortly afterwards, Hindley wrote, I feel as though my heart's been torn to pieces. I don't think anything could hurt me more than this has. The only consolation is that some moron might have got hold of Puppet and hurt him. During the trial, the tape recording of Leslie Ann Downey, on which the voices of Brady and Hindley were clearly audible, was played in open court, to better understand Hindley's role in the torture and murder of the girl. Hindley admitted that her attitude towards the child was brusque and cruel, but claimed that was only because she was afraid that someone might hear Downey screaming. Hindley claimed that when Downey was being undressed, she herself was downstairs. When the pornographic photographs were taken, she was looking out of the window, and that when the child was being strangled, she was running a bath. On the 6th of May, after having deliberated for a little over two hours, the jury found Brady guilty of all three murders, and Hindley guilty of the murders of Downey and Evans. The abolition of the Death Penalty Act had come into force during the time that Brady and Hindley were held in prison and therefore the judge passed the only sentence that the law allowed, life imprisonment. Brady was sentenced to three concurrent life sentences, and Hindley was given two, plus a concurrent seven-year term for harboring Brady, in the knowledge that he had murdered John Kilbride. Brady was taken to Durham Prison, and Hindley was sent to Holloway Prison. In his closing remarks, Mr. Justice Atkinson described the murders as a truly horrible case, and condemned the accused as two sadistic killers of the utmost depravity. He recommended that both Brady and Hindley spend a very long time in prison before being considered for parole, but did not stipulate a tariff. He stated that Brady was wicked beyond belief, and that he saw no reasonable possibility of reform. He did not consider that the same was necessarily true of Hindley, once she is removed from Brady's influence. Throughout the trial, Brady and Hindley stuck rigidly to their strategy of lying, and Hindley was later described as a quiet, controlled, impassive witness who lied remorselessly. 
Immediately following the trial, Hindley lodged an unsuccessful appeal against her conviction. This would be followed over the years with many attempts to win over officials and the public to secure an early release. Not many were fooled by her alleged reformation of character, and she remained behind bars for the rest of her life. A 40-a-day smoker who, in 1999, had been diagnosed with angina and hospitalized after suffering a brain aneurysm, on the 15th of November 2002, aged 60, she died from bronchial pneumonia caused by heart disease. Following his conviction, Brady was moved to Durham Prison, where he asked to live in solitary confinement. He spent 19 years in mainstream prisons, before he was declared criminally insane in November 1985, and sent to the high security Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital. He repeatedly made it clear that he never wanted to be released. In a statement, Brady talks about his wish to die. Myra gets the potentially fatal brain condition. Whilst I have to fight simply to die, I've had enough. I want nothing. My objective is to die and release myself from this once and for all. So you see, my death strike is rational and pragmatic. I'm only sorry I didn't do it decades ago, and I'm eager to leave this cesspit in a coffin. Hospital staff had considered Brady a paranoid schizophrenic. He was treated with antipsychotic drugs, sometimes against his will. The killer died aged 79 in room 35 of Newland Ward on the evening of May the 15th, 2017, where he had spent the previous 32 years. A post-mortem examination concluded Brady, who had been treated with 19 different drugs, died of heart failure caused by severe lung disease. Yes, I've had many requests to cover this case. I've finally gotten around to it. Um, this was something that my parents' generation talked about a lot. It was always, you know, the talk of people in England at that time. We'd never heard, really, of such things before. Uh, for th I mean, this was just really a shock for everyone, that, and particularly that a woman could be involved in it and just as sadistic as the man a really horrific case yes normally i can uh, distance myself emotionally from these crime cases but some of them i can't and this was one of them it certainly affected me um didn't sleep well for a few nights uh, thinking about the the trail of destruction these two left uh, not with the victim count. It wasn't a huge compared to some serial killers. Just the terrible things they did to these poor innocent children and the family have suffered for years because these two were so notorious they were in and out of the newspapers all the time. And as I've read uh, what family members have said, you know, they, they never had any closure. They didn't have any closure. They just always confronted and the fact that Brady lived so long, you know, I don't know. The justice system seems to be geared towards protecting and promoting the rights of the offenders. And the families are just left to, to cope with the best they can. So I'd just like to highlight some things before we wrap this up. Uh, some of the things that really annoyed me, it wasn't just the murders, but it was the way the, the government treats the victims. I just find it outrageous. There's a few things here. Moore's murders. Police denied access to Ian Brady briefcases. Greater Manchester Police's cold case unit still searching for body of Keith Bennett. Now, to sort of have a quick summary here, basically Brady left behind some briefcases and papers. 
which may have the knowledge of where the body of the boy Keith Bennett is. He never ever revealed that. So we have Keith's brother Alan said requests made by the police and himself to Robin Macon, Brady's solicitor and executor of his will, have also been turned down. It's just not right. It's just not right. Uh, what does it say there? Yeah, I mean, the, the family have to continually fight and continually suffer while the rights of these scumbags are protected. I'm not holding back. This is just not right. And I'm not going to publicly say my thoughts about this guy here. He might sue me, but uh, I think you can tell by my tone of voice what I think of him. Absolutely disgusting it is. It's disgusting. The refusal by Macon to help any further is a great cause of distress considering that my brother's body still remains on the moor while all the other victims have been returned to their loved ones for a proper burial. It's so sad. It's so sad. You know? It's quite possibly that this Macon has to do that. That's part of his um, contract as a lawyer. So maybe he doesn't have any, any other option. But the government, that they have just stood by and allowed this... The government could step in and force him to hand that over. They could do that. And then legally he would have no other option. I don't know. Perhaps I was wrong in, in being annoyed at him. It's the government, actually, who, who, who has allowed this to happen. I don't know. Yeah, was it here? Greater Manchester Police spokesman said the application for a search warrant was made to a district judge on the 16th of May 2017 and it was turned down. We did not proceed to the High Court. It is terrible. So that, that's one thing that really annoyed me. Uh, and then we have another case here. Sorry about this. The, the page has been slightly snipped off. I'll read it out to you. Family anguish as Moore's murderer's body part secret revealed by police after 30 years. Pauline Reed's family now face having to stage a second funeral after finding out cops kept some of her remains. Absolutely disgusting. Body parts from a Moore's Murder victim were kept by police for 30 years without her family's knowledge. Why are they doing this? This is like a slap in the face for the family. It's a slap in the face for the family. How dare they? How dare they? I don't know. What a, what a strange world we live in. What a strange world. It is understood parts held include her jawbone and hair samples. And I know that they have kept her... They had kept her shoes and, and, and dress, I believe, and I'll put the photos on the screen for you now so you can see that they also kept these items. Absolutely. Um, and now that they've handed over, they've brought all this back. There's no closure. They've brought all this grief and hurt back to the family. I think it's absolutely outrageous how the system treats the victim's family. It should be better than this. It, it should really be better. Uh, I don't I don't think it's right at all how they just treat us like yeah they just think they can do with us what they want I I really that that annoyed me I must say let me know your thoughts about this my dear viewers and this this poor he, the former police chief has revealed he is still haunted by a recording of Ian Brady's youngest victim begging for her life terrible I do hope her mother didn't have to hear that whole tape it did say that she identified it was her daughter's voice. Oh, my God. This recording is apparently not available anywhere. Thank God for that. I've never listened to anything like that. But there would be some sick people out there who would. Absolutely terrible. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know. These guys were sort of pampered in prison. It's just insane. It's insane. Terrible. Moore's murderer Ian Brady today claimed he received an existential experience from the recreational killings he committed in the 1960s. When asked about the crimes and whether that made him abnormal, Brady, 75, who was speaking at his Manchester Mental Health Tribunal, compared the killings to the acts of soldiers and politicians. What the... F <laughs> My goodness. Well, if he got an existential experience from torturing young children maybe he should have been tortured that would have been another existential experience for him absolutely why don't they just hand over these these people to the relatives like they do in certain countries yeah why don't they just hand them over and let them decide what the what the justice should be 
Oh my God, I have to stop soon. I'm getting so annoyed. Anyway, we'll move on to this, which is this headline saying that the third Moore's murderer exposed evil Brady and Hindley did not act alone. So what they're saying is that David Smith was involved. Um, let's scroll down a bit. They're saying that he was involved to justify. So someone's writing a book, uh, this Erica Gregory. And to justify it, she claims that Brady and Smith were good friends and that they knew each other before the first murder took place and that Smith was complicit in all five killings. And chillingly, in a sickening recording of one of the Moore's victims, Leslie Ann Downey, she claims that a fourth voice can be heard as the horrific events unfold. I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking, would, would Brady protect David Smith all these years if he had been involved? Uh, he did say initially that... Uh, David Smith had helped him with the murder and he was sort of trying to keep Myra Hindley out of it. Was he involved? Was he involved? No, no one else has ever mentioned this fourth voice in the recording. I've never heard the recording. I can't say yay or nay. Um, maybe she has heard the recording. I guess she has. That'll be very interesting. He's dead now anyway, so he can't be brought to justice if he if he was involved, which he's saying here, Brady used to stand at the gate every single lunchtime waiting for Smith after the school bell sounded. He always had a camera around his neck and girls used to run over to him. For me, he was definitely involved in the murders. Probably all of them. He was so close to Brady. Hmm. I have no idea, but uh, it's an interesting read. Well, I think we'll wrap up. It was a long session. I hope you're still with me. It is pretty hard to stomach this case. Anyway, onto something a little bit lighter before I close up. I just want to show you the latest illustration by the fantastic artist Amy Keaton. This is wonderful. This is me reading bedtime stories to all you good folks out there. And keep an eye out for the competition which will be up in a few days. And it's going to be featuring this illustration and what you have to do to enter the competition. So stay tuned for that. I love that, Amy. Absolutely fantastic. And look at the lamp. Isn't that wonderful? That's just fantastic in itself. <laughs> well done, my friend. Well done. This is going to be on my merch too. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll hear about that in the competition. Stay tuned in a few days. Also stay tuned for a blooper at the end here. <laughs> Goodbye, my friends. Take care. And until next time. Bye-bye. His mother, Peggy Stewart, a tea, a tea room waitress. A tea room waitress. Ah. A tea room wait waitress. A tea room, a tea room waitress. A tea room waitress. <laughs> a tea room wait. A tea room waitress. Oh, for fuck's sake. A waitress who served in a tea room. <laughs>